we talked the last time, I talked a little bit about um, this, this whole issue of the imagination that Dante places uh, along with a, a definition of love and, the, uh, and love is the, the, the power that governs, that shapes the moral world of purgatory. Um, last time we talked about this two foci of Canto 17, two foci of the center. It really makes, makes the center a kind of ellipsis, as it were, right, between imagination and love. Um, love is attached to the, it's, it's joined to a theory of free will because it's by choice, uh, because of our choices that we can be held accountable for uh, the actions that we uh, engage in, loving wrong objects, loving too much, or loving too little. And then uh, the, the some of the problems, I think, uh, stem from uh, a certain misunderstanding about the imagination, that Dante should place the imagination at the center of the poem, uh, should really not surprise you, he's a poet, and he thinks that imagination is indeed the path that he has to take in order to come to any, uh, any, any form of knowledge. It's only through the imagination. It's not, that does not exclude rationality, but that's the discourse of philosophers, the discourse of theologians, if you wish. But he places the imagination as his way. Uh, and in, from that point of view, he can even challenge some ideas of, uh, uh, the superiority, let's say, of, uh, of uh, rational argument over the imagination. The imagination is the weapon of the poet. How, with what kind of uh, attributes does he invest the imagination? It's tied to memory. I mean, the, the Canto 17 begins with an apostrophe to the reader's memory. Uh, it's, it appears as, in the feminine, imaginative, uh, the, the, uh, in uh, in uh, uh, the, the Dante silencing the term vis, V-I-S, it has a sort of force. Imagination, is a, it's moved by something else. Dante does not decide whether it's the heaven or the stars or comes from inside us. Uh, but it has a particular power, a strange power. It comes like a thief in the night. It robs us of... Uh, uh, the, the, any degree of, uh, of uh, um, co consciousness about the world outside of us. Uh, uh, and, and just as memory uh, dislodges, uh, you know, the, 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 the description of memory at the beginning of Canto 17, it's a memory that has an incredible memory as a form of the imagination, as you know. Me uh, memory and imagination are connected. The, the, it's a form of the imagination. But it's a memory that um, has the power to move up and down. The, the text evokes the alpine heights and the depth of the moro, the mole. And it, it talks about a form of blindness, and yet it creates vision. Uh, uh, memory is a figure of time, and then the, the, the whole passage is described in terms of uh, space, as if it, imagination had the power to dislocate us from where we think that we are. This is the point, and it's not an unusual point for Dante to make, since this he is. This is the poetry of <laughs> exile, the poetry of a man who thinks that he's a stranger while living on earth, uh, a man who, th without a sense, a clear sense of where his home may be. Uh, he is. This is the poetry rooted in the consciousness of a homelessness. So imagination is an extension, an internalized internalized version of this sense of homelessness. But it has a power, and that power that doesn't seem to be <coughs> able to be, uh, that a power that cannot quite be contained or coerced within definite uh, parameters of uh, conduct. In fact, this uh, insistence on the imagination, I'm really recapitulating the things that maybe I thought I said, and probably I didn't say last time, between, uh, on the one hand, the sin of uh, wrath which is a form of madness, that is to say, uh, a sin that eclipses the powers of reason, that's anger, uh, and on the other hand, uh, at this discourse on love. Okay, so this is really what I, I was saying. Dante understands that there is an imagination which cannot quite be held in check, and yet 
whole point of the poem I'm talking, and whatever I'm talking about the poem, I, I point out some uh, seemingly insignificant details like, oh, look, this is a symmetry here between Canto VI of Inferno, Canto VI of, of, of Purgatory, or whatever, uh, to indicate that it is a poem built with a precise principle of order in mind. Not only it has order in its, in its technical execution, it has order also as a moral problem. It's all about ordering the appetites, ordering the will. But at the, at the same time, alongside with it, and this is the complexity and the beauty of Dante's text, there's some, another argument that almost questions, makes us to, makes us, forces us into thinking that there are some, some elements that seem to be left out of this uh, fabric of order that Dante has woven, or if you like, the metaphor has built, the architecture that he has built. Let's see how these arguments really continue. That, that's not the end of the, of the story. We, this is just a stage in his uh, movement of self-knowledge and, and, and knowledge of the world. Uh, in fact, Canto 18, we are now moving into a different, a different moral realm. Uh, it's a moral realm where actually now we are moving toward the so-called uh, what Dante and medieval uh, theorists uh, of uh, vices call Acadia. Uh, uh, Acadia is a Latin term which in English we can describe, we describe as a sort of despondency, as a sort of indecisiveness, sluggishness, sloth, sloth, that's it. That's this, the, the uh, and if, uh, if you are interested in knowing more about what the Middle Ages thought about this, this uh, uh, scholar, Wenzel, wrote a book uh, called Acadia, exactly about the, both in English, medieval literature, Dante, etc., and other, other issues. What more precisely, how can we go on understanding this question of Acadia? It's, in a sense, the parody or the inversion of contemplation. It's really tied to a, f a sense of loss of the outside world. Acadia describes the condition of the mind that has found itself indifferent to the object of desire. There really is a crisis of desire. One finds the object, that's the, the sloth, the sluggishness, the indecisiveness of the mind. It is as if the objects of desire were, um, had lost their consistency their attractiveness, their luster. You know, you, you just don't care. It's the problem of the, 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 the so-called noonday uh, devil, the temptation, uh, uh, the temptation of the monks. That's why I call it a parody of contemplation. It's the temptation of, that the monks experience in their cloisters when they sort of find that the whole idea of turning their minds to the divine is, is no longer or provisionally, pre perhaps, is not uh, uh, appealing. It's, it's the, the loss of appeal of anything outside of oneself. and indicates a kind of, uh, of, of uh, both intellectual and dreamy sort of condition. And that's really <coughs> what I want to talk about. Now, Canto 18 uh, is the most intellectual of cantos in, 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 in Purgatory. Dante faces a theoretical issue. He's talking to Virgil, and these theoretical issues of Canto 18 uh, flow out of the problems that we have had in discussing Canto 17. As you know, the, we are talking about imagination and love, and there is an imagination that somehow is vagabond, it's a thief, breaks out of any particular confines, it dislodges us, it takes the ground out of our own, our own, our own certainties about the, the, the way we see the world. Remember that the image that with, with which Canto 17 starts, we, he, he, Dante places us in a world which is at the twilight, there's no real light, it's all foggy, and then all of a sudden we do see something and it's unclear whether we see something because of the light that comes from within us, memories. For instance, that's a light we carry within us, confused as they may be, or some other kind of consciousness or intuition. So that's really that the discourse of the imagination, and that dislodged some of us here. That made it a little difficult to, to uh, try to get hold of, grasp. Dante has the same problem in Canto 18. Canto 18 begins with a question that he asks of Virgil. You are talking about love, you are talking about this inclination, 
Canto, the, the whole theory of love in Canto 17, uh, he says, Master, my sight, this is Canto 18, the very beginning, is so quickened in thy light that I discern clearly all that thy words set forth and explain, uh, uh, and explain. I pray, therefore, dear a gentle father, that thou expound love to me, to which you reduce every good action and its opposite. <laughs> Whatever you have told me in Canto 17 really is not enough. And that uh, Virgil goes on explaining uh, uh, the theory that is very a philosophical theory that we have perceptions. Your perception takes from outward reality an impression and unfolds it within you. So it makes the mind turn to it. And whatever the, the, the will is bound, that's really what we call pleasure. I'm paraphrasing poorly. Uh, um, thy words and my falling, and um, excuse me, let me just mention another little passage. Now may be plain, again, line, line 35, now may be plain to thee how hidden is the truth for those who maintain that every love is in itself praiseworthy. He's attacking, the, this is the, the view of the Epicureans who believe that every pleasure without any particular judgment attached to the object of pleasure is praiseworthy. Dante says, no, we have to exercise some moral uh, judgment. Some, some, we, have to dis the, we have to create distinctions. We have to discriminate between the good and the bad love. Perhaps because its matter always seems good, but not every stamp is good, even if it be good wax. I would even go so far as to say that he's really thinking now of his friend Cavalcanti's widow, Epicurean, now you, you saw him mentioned in Canto 12 by name, Epicurean leanings. The idea that that's the Epicurean e ethics, that if pleasure is really the, 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 the only uh, uh, object worthy of any pursuit, and uh, that's really what we are doing whenever we're in pursuit of knowledge or real experiences, then they claim that all of uh, pleasure is, is, is good. Uh, that's the hedonistic ethics that Dante really renounces or debates. And then, in fact, Virgil goes on saying, Thy words and my falling wit, this is Dante talking, answered, have revealed the nature of love to me. But that has made me more full of perplexity. For if love is offered to us from without, and if the soul moves with no other feet, it has no merit. Well, it goes straight or crooked. So you say that everything is love and the, the love that I have depends on the experience of images, but then what, in what, how am I going to deserve for choosing well or not choosing well, since at the, at the basis of the imagination we have perceptions. Um, and what I perceive may be looking good to me and does not look good to you. So the issue is displaced from the point, the world of the imagination to the world of perception. And uh, Virgil go on explaining uh, a, th a scholastic theory uh, to the point that uh, indeed uh, we, 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 uh, we incline to, uh, to the good, but then actually we have within us uh, the faculty of choice, he says. Uh, in order that this will ever they may be conformed, there is innate in you the faculty which counsels and which ought to hold the threshold of assent. He's talking about, once again, uh, free will. And he will add, this is what I, uh, this is on line 60 and following, uh, and he'll add, this is all I can tell you from a philosophical point of view. Uh, other issues about the free will uh, will be explained to you by <coughs> Beatrice when she first comes to you, and so it would seem to make a distinction between uh, the knowledge the, of Virgil and the knowledge of Beatrice. And he said, uh, as far as reasons is here, I can tell thee, beyond that, wait only for Beatrice, for it is a matter of faith, and so on. So there seems to be two ways of understanding this issue. The fact is that Beatrice will never discuss this problem. But in a sense, Beatrice represents the, the explana explanation that Dante is looking for, because Beatrice is the kind of love that, for Dante, that stands for a visionary form of, no of, of love, and not just a love that can be uh, reduced to a question of mechanics, or physics, or perception. Um, so uh, uh, that's really what Canto 18 seems to be doing. Uh, then responds, enlarges, and at the same time brings us back 
into the very predicament that Cale 217 had uh, uh, posed for us. Okay. So it seems that Dante is moving, and at the same time, an impasse, another impasse has been reached. And now, with this in mind, we, we turn to <laughs> what he unavoidably has to do, uh, try to translate all of these issues of love, imagination, um, uh, choice, and from the theoretical into the autobiographical or existential dimension. This is done in the dream, uh, an erotic dream that Dante relates at the beginning of Canto 19. Before I turn to that canto, I just want to tell you about how Dante understands this. He has one line at the very end of Canto 18 that I would, uh, the last line of Canto 18 that I really want to uh, uh, underline for you. Uh, that the whole paragraph reads, then when these shades were so far parted from us that they could no longer be seen, a new thought arose within me from which others many and diverse were born. And I rambled, so from one to the other, that in my wandering my eyes closed and I changed my musing into dream. Hmm? And, that and that introduces the dream of Canto 19. But the line in Italian is really very interesting because it presents the connection between thinking and dreaming. He says, in fact, the translation, my musing, it's correct, but it's really, I would have said, to make it very clear, my thought. Uh, Dante says, one, one line 145, che gli occhi per vaghezza ricopersi e il pensamento in sogno trasmutai. So there's a kind of link, a sort of a, a sense of the connection between thinking and dreaming. And Dante favors dreaming at this point over thinking. You shouldn't be surprised that Dante is doing this. The Romance of the Rose, a grand medieval epic, is a dream and tells the story of a dream. The Book of the Duchess, Shakespeare of uh, Chaucer's Book of the Duchess, is the story of a dream. The Vita Nuova is full of dreams. You know, even for those of you who are interested in contemporary literature, fairly contemporary, uh, I'm thinking of Keats, great poem, Sleep and poetry. I don't know how many of you have had a chance to read that. Poets love sleeping because sleep introduces the idea of the dream and the possibility of a dream, the possibility of a knowledge which is not willed. I finally have some revelations within me which is not what I would normally have if I were awake. Ah, so this is the, the great privilege that they give to dreams. <laughs> are, is the Middle Ages, are the Middle Ages uh, really conscious of this dimension, yes, there is a text by an author called Macrobius, and if you want to know more, I really, which is uh, uh, Macrobius, who writes uh, on the dream of Scipio, Cicero's figure, uh, in the Republic, uh, it's all about, it's, it's an encyclopedia of dreams, and uh, on, based on Artemidorus, but it's, it's, it's uh, uh, distinctions between oracles, fantasies, um, insomniac, uh, uh, deliriums, uh, dreams, and so on. So th they are very conscious of uh, the sort of, of, of power and uh, revelations that can come through dreams. What is this dream about? It's now uh, definitely in the world of Acadia. Uh, it's a dream. Let me, just, let me just read this uh, initial, uh, the beginning of uh, Canto 19. Uh, I emphasize that this is now an autobiographical, um, the highlighting of the autobiographical dimension of all the problems we have been discussing from 17, eight, so above all 16, 17, and 18. Dante is to translate the theories into a personal, giving them a personal shape and that to, to, to investigate the kind of importance that they may have uh, for him. Uh, the, the uh, it starts then with, in the hour when the day's heat overcome by the earth and sometimes by Saturn can no longer temper the cold of the moon, when the geomancers see the Fortuna Major rise in the east before dawn by a path which does not long stay dark for it, there came to me in dream a woman 
stammering, cross-eyed, and crooked on her feet, with maimed hands and of sallow hue. I gazed at her, and as the sun revives cold limbs benumbed by the night, so my look gave her a ready tongue, and then in a little time made her quite erect and colored her wan features as love desires. When she had her speech that set free, she began to sing so that it would have been hard for me to turn my mind from her. I am, she sang, I am the sweet siren who by beguile the sailors in mid-sea, so great delight it is to hear me. I turned Ulysses, eager on his way to my song, and he who dwells with me rarely departs so holy I content him. Her lips were not yet closed again when a lady, holy and alert, appeared beside me to put her to confusion. Oh, Virgil, Virgil, who is this? She said with anger. And he came with his eyes fixed on the honorable one. He seized the other and let her bear in front, tearing her clothes and showed me her belly. They awoke me, that awoke me with a stench, a stench that came from her. I turned my eyes to the good master. Three times at least I have called thee, he said. Rise and come. Let us find the opening by which thou enterest. So that's the, the end of the dream, the account of the dream. And this is also the, uh, uh, the, journey, uh, will, uh, the journey will continue. Uh, that seemed to have come to a halt uh, here at night. Uh, as you recall, um, just to give you a sense of Dante's ordered poetic mind, this is the second of three dreams. Uh, you didn't, we didn't really read the first one about Encanto 9. It was the dream of Ganymede, uh, Dante's moving from the anti-purgatory to purgatory proper, and then it's, uh, the third one will appear in Canto 27. So that really Dante is scanning these three dreams with also a sense of numerical, uh, symbolic numerical precision. Nine, 18, it's told in, uh, in, in 19, but uh, takes place during the night and, and, uh, and, and uh, uh, 27. So this is the it's a dream. It's a dream that um, happens at dawn, uh, just some details. And uh, a dream uh, at dawn has always the value they believed of a, being a kind of prophetic dream. They said, said it's a dream that uh, really has a sort of uh, hue, color of the truth. It says something about, so if, if you understand the dream as an allegory, for say, uh, because it's, it's with about veil, it's about tearing clothes, there is something hidden underneath it all, uh, then it may be uh, this allegory has uh, a truth value. That it has, it's not some kind of uh, mere fable uh, or other. That's, uh, um, Dante starts evoking the planet of Saturn, uh, which is, uh, we shall see that. In, uh, you know that Dante mentions uh, planets and joins them to the various liberal arts. I probably have mentioned this before. So when, when we'll be talking about, uh, say, the moon, uh, Dante is going to discuss grammar. Uh, he'll talk about Mars, the planet of war, and th there he'll talk about music, Jupiter, and justice. Saturn is astronomy, uh, also the, the, the planet of contemplation. In this sense, I, th I think that he's hinting that sloth is, is uh, the obverse side, the parody of, of contemplation, a different type of uh, self-absorption nonetheless, not, not a way of breaking out, the contemplation means breaking out of oneself and, and, and reach some kind of the gates outside of time. Uh, here it's a dream that seems to be a movement, an, an inward movement. Um, so it's Saturn and then he continues with this language of astronomy and divination. Uh, we no longer temper the cold of the moon when the geomancers uh, see the Fortuna Maior. This is our processes of knowledge as divination. That's a different type of rational knowledge, divining signs. So we're, this is the context in which the, the, the dream is set, rise in the east before dawn, by path which has not long stayed dark for it. There came to me in a dream, now the dream starts, 
And the first thing that I have to point out to you is that in, this, uh, uh, in the dream, the dreamer is an object. The dream comes to him. Clearly, it is not willed. It's not something that he decides or he wants. One is the object of some, some uh, uh, exactly dreams or apparitions or signs, images that descend into oneself without one's own self-control or uh, dominion over them. Dante seems to place himself in a condition of passivity, which is the passivity of sloth. Okay? So the idea that I am awake and therefore vigilant and therefore capable of making uh, judgments about what's happening to me is here now, for the time being, bracketed. Um, what is this dream about, though? Um, well, it's a dream of a woman, and, and, and the Italian text plays, since this is a dream about two women, two modes of being, two choices. It's almost as if he were, he isn't, but you know this is the mythography of Hercules, at the Scheider Wege, as they call him, at the, at the, at the, at the, crossing, uh, at the crossing road, has to choose between vice and virtue. But Hercules is an easy time because he's always going to the right, uh, thinking that uh, in, in, in mythography, if you go to the right, then you really have, are going toward virtue. You know, left and right would be uh, dexterous rather than sinister. You know, the idea of the left being, uh, being bad. The, mm, but here we don't have that. Here's two women. But the language of the poem distinguishes very carefully between them. One is a femina, that is to say the materiality, and even a kind of animal sense of the word. And when the other woman appears, she's called a donna. Uh, the donna is the Italian word from domina, uh, the lady. Uh, and he called, he is called a, a, a holy, uh, holy, uh, uh, holy lady. I guess, uh, lady holy and alert, etc. Uh, and, and she is, uh, this, is this woman, uh, she uh, uh, crystallizes what we could call the aesthetics of the ugly. We are always talking about uh, the beauty and the idea that beauty brings about a kind of um, revelation of love and the pleasure that goes with beauty. Uh, and in fact, uh, one can say that love, you know, this is the platonic way of understanding love is always a hunger for beauty. Uh, so we, the conventional way of thinking about aesthetics is to imagine beautiful proportional forms. Here Dante is giving exactly the opposite, an aesthetic of the ugly, but an ugly which is not static and somehow is, uh, experiences metamorphosis. In fact, look what happens. She is stammering, cross-eyed, crooked on her feet. She is the anti-Beatrice by, obviously, uh, with maimed hands and sallow hue. And now it changes. From the dreamer as an object, the dreamer becomes a subject. I. Do you see that? From to, came to me, and then I gazed at her. And as the sun revives, cold limbs benumbed by the night, so my look, my, his desires, transform this image, and from the ugly image that it was, it becomes now instead uh, invested with uh, attributes of attractiveness and call it her when features as love desires, as love uh, prompts. And then this is what we still don't understand who she is. When she had a speech that set free, she began to sing so that it would have been hard for me to turn my mind from her. So. The first temptation that we know that the, the and, and, and the vehicle of the temptation is the song. This is also and primarily a poetic temptation, a certain way of understanding poetry, a kind of even meretricious form of uh, poetry. And what does she say? She brings a, she brings to the center stage the myth of Ulysses, which is by now you all you know, uh, is the this the steady temptation for. Dante is the point of reference to what extent is, I, is on my own journey that I believe is taking place under the aegis of divine providence, to what extent is it a form of transgression, a way of going beyond boundaries, of breaking down all limits, because after all that's what Ulysses did in Canto 26, and Dante knows where he has placed him, but he cannot get him out of his mind because Ulysses stands for something powerful. 
And what he stands for is the idea that there is no knowledge worth having which is not connected with transgressions, which is not connected with with breaking down all barriers and limitations. In a way, because Dante has, doesn't do these things at, in, um, accidentally, when he comes to Canto 26 of Paradise, he will see Adam. And there is another who is, for him, without a doubt, a poet, because he's the name giver. He's the name giver of the world. He is the one who brings the world into being through language. And when Dante meets Adam, There'll be some interesting uh, details that we can talk about there, but I can anticipate this for you. Adam is the one who has understood transgression. Uh, and that transgression law for Adam appears as a sort of growth. It's not a fall for Dante, it's a growth. It's a growth in understanding other types of limitations. Because we, we cannot just say that we, we, we tear down all limits, we tear down some limits in our experience. Adam tears down and the, the uh, eats of the, tr the, the, the fruit of the tree that had been forbidden for him, like a good son. Uh, the father says, don't eat it, and he goes and eats it. And then as he eats it, he grows into a human being. He discovers that the world is not for him to be as a child, that he has to have other experiences of death, of maturity, of work, etc. So there are ways in which we have to understand this idea of breaking limits in a different way from maybe the way I may have conveyed it to you. Nonetheless, Dante here is thinking of Ulysses and anticipates the story of Adam. Uh, this is the great temptation for Dante is to believe that he too, his journey, is a journey that reenacts Ulysses' journey. The siren, that's what she's telling him. What she's telling him is, I made Ulysses happy. It's a it's a lie because we do know that Ulysses never really stopped off the island of Capri in whose grotto the siren is, is mythologically said to reside. We do know that she, he did listen to the song of the siren. Uh, he made sure that his companions would not and he had himself bound, uh, he is again bound to the mast of the ship. Okay, so there is, there is a transgression and the binding going on at the same time. At, the same, at any rate, uh, she lies about, I, I turned Ulysses eager on his way to my song. And he who dwells with me, so the first, the other lie or the extension of the lie is that the siren is making false promises of happiness to the dreamer. What she's saying is you stay here with me and I am the end of all that you desire. I am going to give you all the pleasures that you want, and therefore your journey may very well be over. If you are weary of the road, this is the place where you should stop. We have another figure that emerges, clearly the antagonist of the siren. We don't know who she is. We'll find out very quickly in Canto 30 and 31, because the same scene will be reenacted with the arrival of Beatrice. We imagine that here too, we have forced to imagine that here too she is uh, 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 she is Beatrice. Her lips were not yet closed again when a lady, holy and alert, a woman in the sense of uh, uh, not um, domina, uh, appeared beside me to put her to confusion. Virgil, Virgil, who is this? She said with anger, and he came with her. What is the difference between them, between these two women? They are two different forms of poetry. So now we understand why Dante had to be talking about the imagination all along. Because this is really what will introduce him to the stakes in claiming to be a poet. This is what he's been talking about, the actual faculty of himself as a poet. And the cantos that will come, 21, 22, to 26 and 27, constitute the most important segment about ways of understanding literary history, literary tradition, uh, or the place of originality within uh, that particular history and so on. We are going to enter the world of poetry more directly. So there are two different women. They speak two different voices. One sweet, meretricious, and false, but sweet song. The other one very harsh, who says the journey is not over. One forecloses the journey of and the quest of Dante. Uh, be like Ulysses. I know that you want to be like Ulysses. You can stay here with me and I am the end of all your journeys and your quest. The other one is claiming exactly the opposite. The journey has to continue. These two types of uh, songs, the song of the siren, sweet, 
which has also the stench of death attached to it, the stench of the decomposition of a body. And on the other hand, a journey by this austere voice, the voice of maybe the voice of love, the voice of harshness, no, rather than just the, la the language of, uh, of sweetness, uh, is, is uh, that of uh, 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 love as an ongoing quest. That's what she's saying. So two forms of love, two forms of poetry, two types of women. This scene, in case you're interested in this, many of you, I'm sure, have thought about it, literally uh, stages the, the, the scene at the beginning of the consolation of philosophy uh, of Boethius, which in turn is thinking about, who in turn is thinking about uh, the book 10 of the Republic by Plato. Uh, the idea of the place, the place of love and the place of poetry and, and philosophy. Dante changes that tradition. This is not just poetry versus philosophy. It's two different types of poetry. Poetry can be also a philosophical poetry. Poetry can be meretricious, and poetry can be also the, the sort of uh, rigorous, severe form of investigation of oneself and the world. Two different types of poetry, two different types of loves, two different types of women. Which of the two is better? How can we go on deciding that one is better than the other? Is there an objective pattern, an objective criterion by which we can say Beatrice is actually better than this Irene. Does Dante, is Dante aware of this idea of, uh, yes. And the reason is going to be the following, very simple. The avoidance of death. The Irene is the figure that stands for death. Underneath the pleasures of her language, there is a stench that emanates from underneath. Underneath that allegory, Dante sees the danger of closing and the danger of making the here and now and the limitations of the here and now and the limitations of that song the end of his journey. It's really a choice between an open-ended quest and the foreclosure of the siren. This is the only way in which you can ob objectively believe that there is a hierarchy between these two loves and between these two women. Um, we, we move to Canto uh, 21 and 22, um, but I'm wondering if uh, I shouldn't take a few questions here about this Canto um, uh, or, and the other problems before we move on to something a little bit more, uh, a little bit different, um, more classical, the encounter between Statius and Virgil. So let me see if there are some questions now about this, this phase, this, uh, this Canto. Uh, or would you like to me to go on and then, then maybe we can come back to them? Very good. You say the, 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 the question is excellent. Are we supposed to draw some connection between this scene and 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 the and the scene of Casella? in uh, Canto II, above all, of Purgatory. I call it excellent because I agree, you're supposed to, and, and it's the reappearance under different guises of the same temptation, how the aesthetic can become uh, both a way of gathering people around itself. Uh, that, that's the famous story of Casella. The power of the song just uh, collects, gathers, but at the same time, it induces a sort of forgetfulness of uh, uh, whatever purposes those souls are supposed to entertain and carry out. The difference, of course, is that it's the same story here now. The difference is there's not between, let's say, uh, Casella uh, and, and others with, with the language of, uh, of Cato, the language of, here it's more an, an autobiography directly. We are moved into the consciousness of the pilgrim. We have entered as, as deep as we can into his unconscious mind. This is the moment of when his, he comes to an, an, a, an amazing self-revelation. That had, the story of Casella had the ring of uh, a public discourse, poetry as a public act, um, gathering uh, a number of people around it. So this is uh, uh, very good. That's, uh, thank you for mentioning that. 
And by the way, uh, I don't know that I, we never probably read it, but if you read the beginning, I think I read it in Italian for Professor Brooks, as I know she likes the, the Provencal song, but the beginning of Canto Eight, uh, also that moment of uh, the nostalgia for the, the, the safety of home, uh, th the weariness of the, ev the evening song, uh, etc. cetera. That, that, that represents another version of the same kind of uh, dilemma with which the pilgrim is uh, confronted. Okay, maybe we can get back, back to some of this, uh, things. We move into this literary, this segment of the poem, I said 21, uh, uh, 22, uh, going through 20, 23, 24, uh, which is really uh, has poetry now as uh, it's uh, the subject matter. Uh, and Dante begins with, um, um, let's say, the classical tradition, the relationship between an encounter that pl takes place where in the, in the world of avarice and prodigality, the encounter between Statius and Virgil. As you know, Statius views himself as a disciple of v Virgil, and in many ways he challenges Virgil's ideology, Virgil's thought, whereas Virgil can go on writing a poem, the Aeneid and Eclogues, which are about the, 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 the pastoral world or the Georgics, you know, this world about the cultivation of the earth, where Virgil appears at his most anti-Orphic. You know, he distinguishes and di distances himself from the tradition of Orpheus, the poet of mad love who descends into the, the depths of Hades, uh, and of course is uh, waylaid by, by the mad love for uh, Eurydice and his way of conquering death through the song. He believes that through, by singing he can bend uh, the laws of, uh, of death and, and therefore gain immortality. Uh, Virgil opposes the world of, uh, of, of work, the world of, uh, of, of mature, the responsible world of, of Aeneas, uh, uh, the, 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 the hero who is so divided against himself and yet manages to always find his way around, you know, in, the, in this kind of wriggly, erratic path uh, of, uh, of his epic. Uh, Statius uh, counters Virgil. Uh, Statius writes the Thebaid. He writes another, which he never finished, another little epic called the, the, the Achilleid, the story about Achilles, but he writes it's only a fragment. He writes the Thebaid, which really goes against uh, those claims of Virgil. Uh, he retrieves and makes a conjunction between tragedy and the epic, uh, the world of, uh, the world of uh, Jocasta and Oedipus, the monstrosity of that world, the world of uh, Polynes uh, and the Theocles, the world of Antigone, uh, cast in uh, as a kind of nightmarish world. It's, it's literally the most psychological of these epics, the wars that happen in the mind, and, and, and this idea of uh, uh, monstrosity of human uh, fate and human desires. Uh, and, and so that uh, these are the two worlds that Dante now wants to bring together in this little epilion, I would call it. Epilion is a Greek word meaning a little epic. That is to say, a transcription of two epic texts gathered into one, into a lyrical form. And, and he has a tough, tough task. Because what he wants to show is the possibility of harmonizing the two of them. And he shows how the two of them really go talk as friends. Hmm? Friends across time, of course. Uh, Statius lives around the year 70 AD. Virgil dies in the year 19. Um, um, and now they are friends because poetry has managed. Their poetry has made, made them, uh, the poetry of, of Virgil has made them friends. And, and, and Statius is, is, is a sort of uh, classical version of Dante himself. Dante is the disciple of Virgil, and so was Statius. So he has to bring them together. But it's not a question of making them agree only as because they're two different visions that in and of itself may not be all that difficult. Statius is very skeptical about uh, uh, the empire. Virgil is not all that skeptical. It's possible to read the Aeneid and see that there's a lot of ambiguity in the way in which he, he talks about, about uh, 
Augustus and the Empire, but he's basically writing the epic that justifies the ideology of the Empire. The real difficulty between them is that Dante has a t or the real difficulty and challenge for Dante is that he has to try to understand how Statius has tried to adjust Statius' vision of monstrosity to some idea of the sacred. This is the real challenge. Uh, this is the difference that Dante has from the classical world. How do we understand the sacred? And in what way is, is it possible to use Statius, Virgil, as he already did with Cato, who is, by the way, the, the hero of Lucan, <coughs> the third poet of this epic tradition, Virgil, Lucan, Statius. How is it possible to see in these texts of, of Statius the seeds of something good? How can we build anything good out of this um, vision of heroes uh, and characters um, who uh, just fornicate with, uh, with their own fantasies, who cannot really get out of their, uh, of their minds, who, who just uh, discover their own um, unchanging submission to a force that transcends them to fate. It's really absolutely a different worldview from the world of uh, Virgil. So let me just go on a little bit with uh, uh, 21. Uh, just uh, um, talking, first of all, with uh, Dante begins um, with uh, um, an allusion to um, this natural thirst, natural thirst, which is uh, this world of uh, of the natural th thirst for, for knowledge. It's, it's very much the world of the banquet, the world of Aristotle. We have this incredible thirst uh, for knowledge and then uh, 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 um, this figure called Statius appears. Uh, um, we also being told here that nature, uh, the natural world, uh, is uh, mysteriously shaking, there is an earthquake, because every time that a soul gets liberated from the purgatorial uh, experience or expiation, uh, the, this purification and expiation, then the, the, the mountain uh, trembles and, they, and, and, and Statius can go on with them up to the, the Garden of Eden, and, uh, and then um, uh, Statius uh, reveals himself, and he will say around line 60, um, uh, and I, who have lain in, the, in this pain 500 years and more, stage of speaking, felt, but now my will, free for a better threshold, therefore thou didst feel the earthquake and hear the devout spirits to the mountain render praises to the Lord. Soon the resurrection has taken place. And this is going to be the resurrection of Statius and Virgil. Uh, it's Statius, but also Virgil and their own, their own vision. Uh, so he goes on uh, describing himself and the time when the good Titus, the emperor, the he's evoking the time of the, uh, he's recalling the time of the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem at the time when the good Titus, by help of the king most high, avenged. Uh, it means it's a justice, divine it's the mysteries of justice. The wounds from which poured the blood sold by Judas replied the spirit, I bore yonder the name that most endures and honors most. Famous indeed, but still without faith. Statius, a, a pagan, uh, uh, really born again. Uh, this is uh, the born again pagan uh, uh, that uh, appears in this uh, uh, in, in this canto. So sweet was my spirit of song that Rome drew me. Rome drew me. It's, it's an, an, an interesting uh, image because it's really speaking of uh, uh, Rome having a kind of power that usually we link with love, with, with desire, you know, the, the pool of desire. Rome brought him to it, to, uh, to herself, a Toulousan, without going into that, to itself, and then I was worthy to have my brown and my brows adorned with myrtle. Men yonder still speak my name, which is Statius. And I sang of Thebes, and then of the great Achilles, but fell by the way with the second burden. Uh, he, he could never complete the second text. And now look at the way he speaks about poetry. Spoke, speaks through sparks, as a kind of fire, sparks that kindles the fire in me, where from the divine, uh, flame, the divine flame from which 
more than a thousand have been led. I mean the Aeneid. So that's, that's already poetry now is invested with power. The power to um, light uh, the fire in the readers and in its followers, <laughs> which was in poetry my mother and my nurse. Uh, without it, I, have not, I w had not weighed a dram, and to have lived yonder when Virgil lived, I would have consented to a son from then more than I was due before coming forth from banishment. So there are two metaphors to speak of poetry. One is that of the sparks of fire, and the second one is that of nourishing the inner hunger, mother and nurse. It's, it's, it's uh, nursing, the nursing of... Uh, of its readers. So uh, a great acknowledgement of uh, a master without his knowledge that, that uh, it is Virgil to whom he's speaking. And then Canto 21, which is um, an another image that may remind you of the story of Casella. Um, Statius reveals, Dante reveals Statius' identity, uh, Virgil's identity to Statius, and they try to, uh, the two of them try to embrace Already he was bending to embrace lines 130 and following my teacher's feet, but he said to me, brother, do not so, for thou art a shade, and a shade thou seest. And he, rising, now thou canst understand the measure of the love that burns in me for thee when I forget her emptiness and treat shades as solid things. A mistake that has been um, made before and a mistake that I think uh, is, uh, is meant to, um, to convey the, the, the claims of, or the illusions of poets to believe that there is some kind of solidity to them, and not just to their poetry, to their works, but a solidity to them that then this embrace uh, belies. There's no solidity to them, there's a kind of emptiness. It's a sort of distance between the poets and their works. This is not going to, I think, interfere very much because uh, it's the works, the works of art that we are going to be talking about and, and we in, in Canton 22. Uh, so the, uh, the two poets now are uh, self, uh, in, in each in acknowledgement of the other, and uh, they go on talking about line uh, 10 and following, um, uh, Virgil, um, asks Statius to uh, explain to him why this moral blight existed in him, why the sin of avarice, um, why the sin of avarice. And he says, uh, this is the passage, love, Canto 22, lines 12 and following, love kindled by virtue always kindles another. Uh, that's the sort of uh, vitality and power of love. Uh, it's not self-enclosed. It's one that goes on uh, creating and propagating itself. It has a generosity of its own. Okay, it has a kind of charitableness of its own. If only its flame appear without. So fire and love seem to be conjoined by this common uh, element, the common uh, element of uh, the power of propagation or self-perpetuation. Um, uh, from the hour, therefore, when Juvenal descended among us in the limb of hell and made the affection known to me, my goodwill towards thee was as great as ever held anyone for a person not seen, so that now these stairs will seem short to me. But tell me, and as a friend, forgive me, if with too much assurance I slacken the rain. And as a friend, speak with me now. How could avarice find a place in thy breast along with so much wisdom as by thy zeal thou wast filled with. Um, this is a, a, a passage of some, uh, some importance the, because, first of all, the claim of friendship between, that from Virgil, he's moved by the show friendship on the part of Statius. Is this, let's talk now as, as friends. Um, friendship is an ethic of virtue, as you know, in uh, Aristotle's ethics. And for Cicero, who writes a treatise called On Friendship, which Dante mentions at the beginning of his uh, philosophical text, in the belief that friendship is really the other language, the other term for philosophy. Uh, it's the friend and the philosopher 
are interchangeable. Because as if there is, there is a love of, uh, in friendship, there is a love of truth. That, that, is, the, uh, that, that is the idea. Um, there is some exaggeration on the part of Virgil because there is really, a friendship implies some kind, some degree of equality, right? You must have, in order to be friends, you must have some idea of equality. In fact, it's usually said that tyrants and slaves are not capable of love or friendship because both, since one is the version of the other, both really have a kind of uh, 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 inequality vis-a-vis -vis the other. The slave is by definition inferior, the tyrant thinks uh, he's superior. So friendship demands a kind of equality. And this is a little bit of an exaggeration because there is no equality between Statius. Uh, it's a rhetorical exaggeration, Statius and Virgil. Virgil is um, uh, acknowledges being superior to Statius. Statius sees himself as a disciple and therefore views Virgil as superior from a poetic point of view. From a theological point of view, Statius is superior to Virgil. Because Statius is going on to paradise and Virgil is going to go back to limbo. So there is a kind of uh, uh, the, the, uh, a push in the, in the, in the direction of uh, wishful thinking maybe on the, on the, part, of, uh, on the part of Virgil. I must also add that Dante has a, 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 a kind of, uh, some work also to do about, he, he may be aware that friendship was never really thought of as a Christian virtue. It's a classical and pagan virtue. And because it really confuses, you know, it's the idea is a friend is always part of one's soul. Uh, it's really earthbound. It's, a, it's, it's a, an earthbound uh, 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 experience, so it, it was always the thought, not Augustine, Augustine who has a friend, Alipius, and feels responsible for Alipius, but by and large there was this idea that the that friendship could distract the mind from, uh, from an ascent to uh, higher and superior ends, paradisiac uh, ecstasies. Uh, and pleasures. So, oh, but Dante must be aware that there were efforts to Christianize this uh, this idea. Nonetheless, it, it brings the conversation between them back to the earth, uh, and they talk as if they were two friends really meeting in the forum, uh, in the agora, and chatting about uh, their moral failings or their own uh, poetic crafts and visions. How could you find? Uh, how could you be uh, so avaricious? when you are so enlightened in so many other ways? That's the question. Statius responds that he's not avaricious. And I think that that adds a great deal about th their understandings, their misunderstandings of each other, but also their understandings of poetry. He goes on talking about him, the fact that he is prodigal all the time. So that is to say uh, that he, uh, you may remember from Canto Seven of Inferno, the difference between the avaricious and, and, and the sins of prodigality. Uh, uh, prodigality was a, a, a violation of the economy of goods by devaluing, by getting rid, devaluing uh, uh, them, not holding on to them. The avaricious overvalues the goods and tries to, to heap a mass uh, larger quantities of goods. So but, but he goes on uh, really thinking, Statius wants to make it clear for at least 40 lines about the fact that he's, uh, he was prodigal. And we have to understand what, why he would say that. And then in fact he goes on acknowledging once again Statius for his moral conversion. So that's the first thing about what poetry can do. He says, know then that avarice was too far removed from me and this excess thousands moon have punished have punished, and had I, had it not been, that I corrected my ways when I understood the lines, where as if enraged human nature that did cry, to what, O cursed hunger for gold, that thou not drive the appetite of mortals, I should be rolling the weights and know the dismal jousts. What he's saying is that he read a passage in uh, book three of the Aeneid, the story that we already saw of Polydorus, uh, who had been killed because of uh, they want to rob him of his gold, and uh, uh, Statius reached the moral conversion. Um, I like there's a lot we can say about these lines. The first of all, first of all, um, I think this exemplifies how we actually read. We read and we dismember the integrity of a text. We take out of a book, out of a passage, that which we we find. Um, relevant to us. 
um, and he takes uh, some lines uh, in, and, and not only takes some lines from the book three of the Aeneid, he also alters their meaning. The, the, the original text of Virgil says exactly the opposite. Uh, to what? To why do you not contain uh, the, the uh, why do you not contain the hung, the appetite of mortals or sacred, sacred uh, hunger for gold, which the text says is cursed. Because the word sacred, which Dante is using here, why do you not uh, contain all sacred fame of gold or sacra fame del loro? The word sacred, as you probably know, some of you may know, means two things. It's the most ambiguous term that you, semantically speaking, because you can describe both that which we call the holy and that which we call the profane. It joins them together. There's no clear-cut distinction between the profanation or blasphemy, on the other hand, or the sense of holiness. So I can understand why my translation, St. Clair, my translator, uh, decides to choose the cursed instead of uh, call it sacred. For instance, the cursed, he's, 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 he's dismembering, he's taking one, one side of what is a much more complicated version of the meaning of the word. So that's one thing, but the poetic text of Virgil has a moral power over and against Virgil's own intentions. We can understand now retrospectively why Dante has to distinguish between poets and their works. That, you know, we, we can read the works regardless of the intentions of the authors and we can, we can select or take out uh, of those texts whatever we think that we, ha however we think that they speak uh, to us. And then he goes on uh, uh, describing his poetic growth. Now, this is lines uh, uh, 55, now when thou didst sing the cruel arms of the double wolf Jocasta, the double wolf is the two children, Eteocles and Polynes, in the, the tragic and epic text called the Thebaid, said the singer of the bucolics, so see that's already the opposition. Uh, Virgil now appears as the author of a pastoral poem, the bucolics, where a rivalries are always going to be placated. There's a, the bucolics of uh, uh, the pastoral poems of Virgil are always about rivalry, rivalry between uh, two shepherds. Which of, which of us, they ask, is the better singer? Which of us is the better poet? And that is always, uh, there's never any tragic outcome. There's some, some, some uh, uneasiness, some anxiety between in uh, running through that kind of debate between the poets, but it's not the rivalry of, Joc of, of Polynes and the Theocles. So that's, that's really the difference that Dante is highlighting between them. And then he continues, uh, it does not appear by the notes which Cleo touches with me. Oh. So the bucolics, and on the other hand, Cleo is the muse of history. So Cleo is the muse for history, is the world of Statius that the faith yet may be faithful without which well doing is not enough. If that is so, what sun or what candles dispel thy darkness so that thereafter thou didst lift the sails be fine, be behind the fishermen? Now we know that what he's really asking in a general way is the relationship between poetry and faith. How could Statius, we know how he reached this moral conversion, now we have to be told somehow, how did he go on finding uh, faith? What is the relationship between the two of them? Can poetry reveal and lead us onto the world of faith or not? Uh, and Statius has already, that's really the answer that he will provide. And the other answered him, thou first directed me to Parnassus, the mountain of poetry. So the poetic experience the poetic apprenticeship is the, the preamble to the experience of faith. To drink in its caves, mm, uh, a metaphor that picks up the natural thirst of the previous canto, to drink in its caves, and first after God enlightens me. Thou didst like him that goes by night and carries the light behind him and does not help himself, but makes wise those who follow when thou sayest, 
a moment we'll see what he said, but the metaphor is that of really, uh, uh, Virgil is a prophetic voice who speaks, but that language he uses like the la the, the uh, a lamp that he carries on his back for the benefit of those who follow, and himself clearly remains in the dark. That's what he said. The age turns new again. Justice comes back, and the primal years of man, and the new race descends from heaven. This is the famous fourth eclogue of Virgil, uh, where Virgil is uh, celebrating the birth of a child, polio, and around this birth of a child, he's also talking about the rejuvenation of the world. Uh, it's an emblem, Polio's birth is an emblem for uh, this Pythagorean vision that he has, a vision whereby the world goes through uh, 360,000 years of uh, the Golden Age, uh, the, uh, the Silver Age, and so on, and then degrades itself and goes right back to where it started, a Pythagorean vision of uh, metamorphosis and circulation of the universe. It's the fourth eclogue. Um, um, and interestingly, this also crystallizes that which is the fundamental issue of Virgil's vision, the concern with birth, the concern with uh, the fact of being born, that the fact of being born has within itself the potential to renew uh, the world, to affect the world and change the direction of the world. And then he, we know that he will say, and I will stop here uh, because we are coming to the end of the period, through thee I was a poet, through thee Christian. But thou, that thou may see better what I outline, I shall set my hand to color it. Already the world was uh, everywhere big, pregnant, the Italian says, with the true faith sown by the messengers and so on. He's going to talk how the world outside only buttressed, reinforced the message of faith that he had found in the fourth eclogue. Okay, the fourth eclogue is seen as a messianic eclogue. Uh, but that line that makes the transition from poetry to faith, I was a poet through thee, I was a poet through thee, a Christian, I think it really makes it necessary for us to linger on it for a little bit. First of all, the line has what we call an anaphora, through thee, through thee, I was a poet, I was poet, through thee, Christian. This is the same line. Uh, it says, um, per te, the Italian word line 74, uh, sorry, 73, per te poeta fui, per te cristiano. The anaphora gives continuity to the movement of the line from poetry to faith. Uh, per te, per te. Nonetheless, if you read this line carefully in Italian, you see that there is also a sejura falling. You know what I mean by sejura falling in the middle. A break, per te poeta fui, break, per te cristiano. The line gives a, has a mobility that seems to uh, promise the transition from poetry to faith, but at the same time, technically, it forces you to stop as if there were two discontinuous experiences. You cannot quite go from one world of poetry to the one world of faith. You can go from one world of poetry to one world of faith. This, that ambiguity of poetry is exactly what they are trying to retrieve. So what did I say here today about this, this issue of Statius and Virgil? Uh, Statius is dealing with the tragedy of birth. Virgil deals with, with optimistically about the history making uh, quality of the event of birth. There is at the same time a desire to establish a sense of what is the sacred. I will try to discuss with you um, a little later how poetry is now invested with a, the, a kind of sacredness. Th the ambiguous sense of the word has both the profane and, and, and the holy within it. Uh, it's, an, it's, it's, it's a hybrid, and this is this hybrid that I will allow Dante to assimilate uh, Statius' vision to his own understanding of history and the sacred. So let me stop here and see if there are questions. Um,
please. Well, the, the, the Virgil is the, uh, the question is, uh, it seems that usually it's Dante who interviews the people he meets. And, but here in Canto 21 and 22, it's Virgil. And is that the case? And if it's true, why would that be the case? The answer is that that's not really true because in the Canto of Ulysses, it is he who, it is Virgil who speaks, you remember, to to Ulysses, it's Virgil, so it's Virgil and Ulysses. It has really more to do with the, the figures of the classical world that seem to be, in this case, Virgil seems to be best indicated for uh, Statius as he, as he was for Virgil. Since you're interested in this kind of, uh, of um, uh, aspect of the dramatization of the poem, I could mention to you, for instance, there are cantos in Inferno, we didn't have the chance to talk about them, where the Virgil, we completely abandon Dante says, well, you go here. I don't want to be with you. Uh, you, you go and, and, and on your own carry out this introduction without, I'll wait for you here. And that happens, for instance, in the canto of fraud, the, 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 and, and, and usury. Um, it is as if Dante had something to better understand on his own uh, without Virgil's presence. But usually that is the way in which uh, the style of, uh, of the representation takes place. Uh, who, who is most uh, apt uh, in the case of the classical figures, the classical poet speaking to a classical character? In the, in the dream. The siren, yes, in the, in the dream, that she, when she, um, to bring forth the, this promise of happiness, you know, it's really echoing the, the promise of Lucifer of this, you know, I will make you like God. And, um, why is this sort of, it, um, why is this theme of, of sort of the Adam theme coming up here in 19, and is there some sort of strand that I'm missing? The, well, the, you, the question is that uh, uh, since in Canto 19, in the dream of the siren, there is uh, uh, an echo of uh, the fall of Adam, um, more than Lucifer, I would say, fall uh, Adam, yeah. the fall of Adam. And, and why would there be uh, that, uh, uh, if that's true, why would there be that echo? And my answer is, I, I, hadn't, I, I didn't catch it. I, did, I never caught this uh, uh, echo of Adam there. Um, it's, an e it's actually the story of uh, uh, the temptation of this woman fish, that's what she is, right? The, the siren uh, who wants to induce forgetfulness in uh, the pilgrim. It's m really a classical figure. Um, I would say that um, I, I, I re sort of resist the hearing here, the figure of uh, in the figure of Adam, because Adam doesn't really talk about falling. See, this is a danger for the pilgrim, who he's he's a, he's, a, he's uh, dramatizing his sense of uh, of yielding, surrendering his will to the seduction, the seductive song of the siren. Adam, um, with and this is a story of love. With Adam, a story becomes one of knowledge. Uh, it's a little bit different. Uh, there may be echoes. I'm not. I'm not going to be so um, so firm and saying no. There is no echo of that. But I didn't. I didn't. I didn't catch it. I didn't feel a necessity for that. Actually, for my um, okay. argument. Well, maybe I'm answering my own question here. But wouldn't you say that the the theme of knowledge and transgression runs through both the the, the dream sequence that Dante has? And the, the story of Adam's fall. I mean, is 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 there um, that theme where Ulysses, you know, wanted to sort of gain this knowledge, this experience of 
right. of hearing a siren song, right? And, um, and to gain that knowledge, he had to sort of transgress. And isn't that what the siren represents? He does. He oh, mentions yeah. the story of Ulysses. He does mention the story of Ulysses. Where the Adam connection really comes in because Adam ultimately ate the fruit for knowledge. Yeah. Well, I, I, I indicated that the, the story of Adam in Canto 26 uh, it retrospectively illuminates what's happening in Canto 26 of Inferno mm -hmm. and that he too uh, experiences, uh, understands knowledge and, uh, and, 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 and transgression, that they, that they go hand in hand and that it's difficult and impossible to separate them. And that's the story of Ulysses. Dante does feel that he's, and, and it's a dangerous uh, temptation for him to believe that he's, he's, a, he's like Ulysses. Whereas he has no problem later in uh, when he understands what the story of Adam is in thinking in acknowledging that Adam is the arch poet. You know, we are all reinventing the world, etc. Uh, so uh, they are, I would say that there are three figures here, Ulysses, Adam, and Dante, and, but the relation between them is never what, what one of full of identification on the part of Dante with either. Uh, you know, he comes, he approximates them uh, and somehow also pulls away from, from both. He's not really Adam, he's not the arch poet who names the world, and he's not really Ulysses. That fear that he may be like Ulysses, which is a more dangerous uh, uh, sen sense that he has, that will continue more openly uh, as he goes on. The story of Adam, uh, you know, is going to be picked up in the Garden of Eden. Uh, in the Garden of Eden, of course, there is the, the idea that we lost the garden, uh, but Dante does not want to be in that garden anyway. Uh, when he comes to the Garden of Eden, he identifies it uh, with a lot of things, uh, the, with a really nostalgia for the mother. Uh, and and he, doesn't, he understands that he has to grow up. He has to get out of that fantasy. Uh, I don't know if, uh, uh, you know, this is... Uh yeah, um, what confuses me, I guess, is that, um, you know, the, the siren here in the dream sequence seems to be wanting to halt Dante's quest, his journey forward. Yes, absolutely. And yet, with respect to Ulysses, the siren seemed to represent the opposite in the sense that his interaction with her was um, uh, was something where he was trying to go past the balances yes. you know, to gain knowledge or gain experience of, uh, of hearing her. Uh, so I'm trying to draw the connections in my mind for what, it, what is really Dante trying to tell us with this sequence? Uh, why does he go back to this um, this reference to the sirens? This, this reference to the sirens. I mean, maybe you could just summarize. I guess maybe it would help clear it up. Um, what she represents for Dante here in Canto 19 versus what she represents uh, to Ulysses. Yeah. Uh, good. Well, so what does the siren represent? Very briefly, uh, what does the siren represent to Dante and uh, to Ulysses? What is the difference? To Dante, the siren represents the, l the lure of death. He understands that beneath that, that promises of yield to the here and now and to my voice, there is really uh, a, dis there's a nothingness. And he's attracted to that nothingness. That's really what it is. For Ulysses, she also represents the extraordinary uh, enchantment of the song that would lead him to death because that's, that's, that's what happens to all those who listen to the siren. Ulysses wants to hear it and bind himself so that it does not yield altogether to her call. That's, that's how I can put it. Thank you. We'll see you.